what do you know about smog? What is it? Uh, I think it's like the pollution in the air caused by factory smoke and stuff like that. And do you know if there's like any health risk to it or anything like that? Probably some like breathing uh, problems or lung problems. You know what it is? Like it's like pollution in the air. So, Faye, what do you know about smog? Like, what is it? What do I know about smog? Um, well, it's not good for you. Yeah. You breathe it in. Mm -hmm. It's uh, there's always smog alerts in the summer. Mm -hmm. So if you are a child or if you're elderly or if you have asthma, you stay in. It's not good to breathe in. Yeah. And what what's wrong with it if you breathe it in? The toxins. Mm -hmm. Great ones. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, so, hey, everyone. What do you guys know about smog? What is it? Well, we're recording this. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it is intensified by smoke. It's like a form of some greenhouse <laughs> gas caused by like factories, buses, cars, all that jazz. Smog is stupid. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. It's chemicals, nitrogen oxides, and other chemicals which are produced by burning fossil fuels. The word comes, it's a combination of smoke and fog, and you put the two together. Smoke comes because you have particles that come from combustion, and so there are these black things in the sky. And when people breathe in particles that come from coal being burnt, it ultimately can cause you know, a lot of problems. So, Smog has been around for hundreds of years. Uh, where we first really saw it big time was in the city of London in 1952. And they had a heavy fog event mixed in, because they were burning so much coal in the city, uh, mixed in with the normal kind of uh, particles coming from combustion, and it all sat there for days and days and days, and something like 4,000 people died coming out of this. And so that was the first time that governments really started to think, there's a problem here, and we need to do something about it. So when smog is created, it doesn't really go away after time, it kind of just blows around in the winds, and just yes, goes, it, falls over different things. Absolutely, cities. You're, you're quite, it all depends on the wind patterns. So where smog is really a problem is in cities like Los Angeles, and Mexico City, and in both of those, Mexico City is in, it's like it's in a valley, it has uh, high hills all around it. So you have what's called an inversion, where you don't have winds blowing it through, and so smog is getting pumped into the atmosphere and it's staying there. And then the solution is, uh, to, to get rid of it, is winds coming through and blowing it through. So that's why the prevailing winds in North America, if we had a map of North America here, this is Canada, this is the United States, winds are going toward the east and they're coming up from the south. So if we're here in Toronto, the smog we're getting is from down in Ohio, places like that, and it's blowing through. And so the smog event is really related to winds. If you don't have winds to get rid of it, then you have more of a problem. Oh, so that's the only thing that gets rid of like once once it's created, there's no way of getting like completely right. making the air clear again. Yeah, it's, it has to blow up once it's as you, exactly as you put it. Once it's created. Um, are there economic consequences to smog in yes. the city? There are economic consequences. They're generally measured in health impacts. Um, smog sends uh, young kids with asthma, older folks with with uh, respiratory problems to hospital. Um, the Board of Health has done a, a lot of work on this, and smog has a huge impact on health care costs. Where that rolls into uh, city costs is that when people become frail or people become unable to work because they have health issues, um, you start to generate social service costs, and Toronto tops up social service, welfare, um, <coughs> stuff like that, health benefits, as well as in the housing field. Um, housing becomes a really serious challenge. Yeah. Because people who can't work or have to take care of somebody else end up with housing problems. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. So, as you mentioned before, like the cars are a big part of the smog, obviously, and I understand that Rob Ford's against the bike lanes. So, when increasing the amount of bike lanes, obviously, reduce the amount of driving. So, why is he against them? Well, Rob comes from a mindset that the, the car is king, and, mm -hmm. and, and that all that's good in the world has, has um, flowed from um, the 
delivery of the, of the, of the combustion engine to a, to a single passenger vehicle form to, to the, the city we have today. So anything that, that, if the car is king, anything that's built to accommodate the car is good. Anything that's built to, to frustrate motorists is bad. So yeah. he's against urban development that's compact. He's against uh, bike lanes. He's against, 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 against mm -hmm. a lot of stuff. Um, the, 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 the only good news is that he's so cheap with money that he's afraid to put into action. His vision of a new Toronto should be more expressways and, and, and uh, more single-family homes. And because he can't actually say yes to his ideas, what we get is his chorus of no's to, to the other environmental initiatives. But uh, he's one voice in a council of 44, 45. Um, there are 44 other voices, even his brother, that, that sometimes disagree with him. And so while he may have um, the microphones, to his advantage, he doesn't have counsel on side, nor does he have the public on side. Mm -hmm. The exact same argument I get from the cyclists that say to me, and as soon as I get the emails, the first thing they say is, you're a fat slob, they go after my big belly, and I say, okay, I can understand that, fine. But what's the solution, okay? Because the cyclists say, I hate you motors, I can't stand you guys, and they flip you the bird as you're going down Queen Street or Dundas Street. There's this huge animosity between the motorists and the cyclists. There's this huge animosity and it's never going to go away, Madam Speaker. So what is the city of Toronto doing in terms of getting rid of smog, or at least trying to reduce it? Uh, the city of Toronto is doing several things to try and reduce uh, their contribution to pollution by reducing their energy use. Uh, one of the initiatives we're doing is called the Corporate Smog Alert Response Plan. And what that is, is when the Ministry of the Environment releases um, a smog alert, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, mm -hmm. we have a set of plans in place to try and reduce our contribution to pollution, especially on those days. And those plans differ for every division in the city. We have all kinds of divisions, people that work outside, people that work indoors. So for people that work indoors, we have actions that are recommended to staff, um, things like wear lighter clothing so we don't have to power our air conditioning as high. Uh, for people that work outdoors and do work outdoors, we have a series of actions that are recommended and that involves things like um, suspend the use of non-essential, um, uh, what do you call it, gas-powered machinery. So we might not like cut lawn the... lawnmowers or something. Exactly. Like we might not cut the grass on that day if there's a smog alert. We know from the science that short-term exposure to air pollution can trigger the following either alone or in combination. And we're talking about irritation to the eyes, uh, nose and throat, altered breathing patterns, uh, upper respiratory infections such as bronchitis and pneumonia, headaches or nausea, uh, aggravation of asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, and this happens by um, increasing bronchoconstriction, uh, lung inflammation, and airway resistance. Uh, we also know for a fact that long-term exposure to air pollution increases the risk of respiratory and cardiovascular conditions such as allergies, asthma, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, lung cancer, heart failure and arrhythmia, as well as cardiac arrest. There's also a new um, body of research which shows that pollution is also associated with damage to the brain, nerves, uh, liver and kidneys. And for people that are very active outdoors when there are high concentrations of air pollution, uh, we know that they may experience reduced lung function and increased respiratory discomfort. They might have higher heart rates than normal during exercise. They might have higher rates of feeling tired and they have they may have reduced capacity to exercise well. We also know that individuals with pre-existing conditions like asthma or allergies may find that their symptoms are triggered by certain air pollutants. So people with asthma might um, have coughing, wheezing, uh, shortness of breath, or chest pains due to air pollution. But in terms of its locations uh, of prominence, it's more of a regional issue rather than a strictly Toronto issue. Um, when we're talking about smog, when we're talking about individual air pollutants, there are certainly places in Toronto where it's more prominent than others, and that's usually where that pollutant is being emitted. So, yes, if you're standing at a busy uh, traffic intersection in Toronto, you will have an acute level of exposure to a series of pollutants that come from motor vehicles. If you're standing next to a smokestack at a plant, you will definitely be 
um, exposed to a greater amount of pollutants in that area. What is the difference between air pollution and smog? Or okay. is there a difference at all? No, they're the same. They're related. Um, so the difference is that you know cars, vehicles, plants, factories all emit pollutants, individual air pollutants. You've heard of these things like carbon dioxide, particulate matter, nitrogen dioxide, all these big fancy words. Smog is a series of those pollutants existing in the air and what makes it smog is when heat and sunlight hit those pollutants that mix and the heat and sunlight causes a chemical reaction to occur between those pollutants and additional pollutants are actually formed in that chemical reaction. Um, if every driver of a small vehicle in Canada avoided idling for five minutes a day, we would prevent more than one million tons, one million tons of carbon dioxide from entering the atmosphere each year. So if you're not going to do anything, the one thing I'm going to ask you to do is to stop idling your car when you don't need to have it on. So what if it's just on and you're playing music or something and it's not started? Like the battery? Yeah. That's not the same as when the engine is uh -huh. on, so you're okay to listen to the two yeah. things at that time. <laughs> okay. Um, so say it was a high level smog day in Toronto, what can we do to protect yourself from the negative effects of smog? That's another very good question, thank you for asking that. Um, the first thing I want to tell you is, the fact of the matter is there are no safe levels of exposure to air pollution. Science shows that even at very low levels there are health consequences, so we need to do whatever we can to improve the quality of our air. Um, I also want to tell you the fact of the matter is that research shows that the benefits of physical activity outweighs the risks from air pollution. So, do you know what smog is and what the effects it has? Yeah, smog. It's like uh, C6, uh, 8, uh, there's O's in it and there's some H's. It's all, it's in the sky and um, it comes down and it pours acid on our babies. If you get it on your, on your private parts, it makes them not, they're not as good anymore. They'll probably uh, both both smell bad and not work well, which is a deadly combo. So we gotta get this damn smog out of the air. We gotta get it out of the air. There's so much, it's, it's getting all over us and we're not getting rid of it. Right. That's all I'm trying to say.